to sign up for that children's story. I may need a sooner eye exam. <laughs> a little worried about my eyes now. <laughs> Couldn't see a lot of those things. So before we have the deaconesses stand for uh, tithes and offerings, I would like to read a story. And it's entitled, A Hundred Cows for Tithe. The Maasai tribe in Africa loves cows. When an elderly person dies, the Maasai people see it as part of life, and they move on. When a baby dies, they are sad, but they also move on. But when a big bull dies, a Maasai man will mourn terribly. He will tell story after story about the bull's strength, its handsome features, and its leadership over the herd. The owner will lie awake all night weeping over his loss. A Messiah man will not give up a cow for anything. He loves his cows. So it came as a big surprise to Seventh-day Adventist leaders to hear that a wealthy Messiah man had decided to give 100 of his precious cows as a tithe to God. The man Abraham had been baptized into the Adventist church in northern Tanzania and felt impressed to give one-tenth of his cattle as tithe. Abraham called the local pastor to collect the cows. I don't want to keep what belongs to God, Abraham told the stunned pastor. Abraham took the pastor to his field and began to count out his tithe. One, two, three, four, five. Abraham counted to the cows in his herd. Six, seven, eight, nine. And when he reached the tenth cow, he instructed a helper to put a tag on his ear so that cow would be set aside for tithe. That one is for the Lord, he said. He counted out 100 cows. Abraham's Messiah neighbors, who were not Adventists, thought he had gone mad. Why would you give away your cows, said one. If you can return 100 cows as tithe, why don't you just start counting your children and return the tenth child as tithe, said another. Abraham had 20 children because he had been married to four wives before his baptism. Now he had one wife, but he still remained the father to his 20 children. But Abraham didn't argue with his neighbors. I know a person in the Bible who did not have 10 children, he said. He only had one child, and he was more than willing to return that only child to God. And his name was Abraham, too. After Abraham returned the tithe of 100 cows to God, something unusual happened to his cattle. His cows started giving birth to twins. Cows usually give birth to only one calf at a time, but all of Abraham's cows began to give birth to twins. The neighbors were shocked. Abraham had given away 100 cows, and now he had more cows than even before. Call your pastor, one neighbor said. I also want to give a tithe. We want our cows to have twins too, said another. Abraham marveled over the way that God was blessing him and decided that he didn't want to return just one tithe. He wanted to give two tithes, and he called the Adventist pastor. When I gave the 100 cows as a tithe nine months ago, I wanted to see what would happen, Abraham said. I have seen abundant blessings. Instead of bringing forth one calf, my cows have started to bring forth twins. Abraham took the pastor to his field and counted out two tithes, two cows out of every ten. The pastor was amazed by how God has blessed Abraham's faithfulness by making him richer and richer. You are never losing when you return to God, the pastor said. The Lord is faithful. He will even multiply what little you have. Amen. Amen. With that, can I please have the deaconess to stand for prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful for stories like this, encouragement. This will give encouragement to anybody who's maybe struggling with tithes and offerings. You ask us to try you, dear God. We know that you bless beyond measure. Your blessings, we can't even begin to imagine all the things that you want to give us and bless us, and we see them on a daily basis. So we pray, dear Lord, that you please help us, each and every person in this room, no matter how tight things get, no matter how difficult life gets, or finances, that we always give you the small portion that you ask for, that we leap out in faith and never hold back what's yours, because we know that the blessings you have in store for us are greater than we could even imagine. Please bless all the tithes and offerings that are collected today. May it be put to good use to serve as spreading your word throughout the world, and that others can come to know you. And we just pray for a special
special blessing upon the money that's collected today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Sabbath, everyone. Um, listening to Maria's story there, that was uh, an interesting one. I tend to wonder how much me and Jessica gave before we had our twins. Yeah. Right here. It's amazing. I have a lot to say this morning, but hopefully <clears throat> I won't take up that much time saying it. I begin this message somewhere around Thanksgiving and just compiling notes and notes, and finally, I was able to put it together a couple weeks ago. And let's just say, it was hard to put it together. Not because of what it's saying, but I, I believe it's a message that possibly maybe someone here needs to hear, or maybe someone who's listening on Facebook or YouTube. But I believe this is something that we all need to hear for this time to realize what's actually happening in our world, and what's about to happen. So with that being said, let us have opening prayer, and we'll get into this morning's message. Loving Heavenly Father, once again, we come quietly before you in humbleness, and ask that your presence and the presence of your angels descend upon us and dwell with us here. This is a time in which we have set aside to listen to your word and hear what it is you have to say. And I, for one, am grateful that you have allowed me to be the person that you used to deliver this message this morning. I just ask, Heavenly Father, that you will help each and every one of us to be in clarity in regards to this message, but that it helps us to depend upon you even more. Bless my shortcomings at this time, Heavenly Father, and help me in any need in which I need right now to deliver this message. I thank you for all these things, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. <laughs> how many of you, my first question, how many of you like frogs? Raise your hand. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. <laughs> about seven of you. So that's maybe, maybe a quarter of the people in here. Now I tend to wonder, are people who like frogs weird? What do you guys think? Some of you guys will say they're weird. Zach is openly saying they're weird. Because it's kind of not natural for us to like reptiles. Right? We think they're slimy. We think they're gross. Whatever the case may be, they pee on us, give us warts. It's not true, by the way, but that's that wise tale, right? But how many of you liked frogs since you were small? Now, let me ask this a different way. How many of you women have liked frogs since you were small? There's a couple of you, a couple of you. Can you tell me why you've liked frogs since you were small? Since we have Alyssa who raised her hand taller than Roxanne, Alyssa, tell me why you like frogs since you were small. Quickly. I think they're cool. You think they're cool. Roxanne, why did you like frogs? Their eyes. Their, their faces. Their eyes, their bulging eyes, their wide, weird-looking face and lips, whatever the case may be, right? But, and it may not be here, but I know for a fact that the majority of women like frogs. Now, why do I say this? Because most people, including women, have grown up with the understanding and perspective is that if you want to marry this most handsomest, 
most greatness, most tall figure stature of a man, what do you have to do? You have to kiss a frog. And let's be honest, how many of you tried that? Don't answer, right? Alyssa's well, raising your hand. Right? That's just kidding. So this is just a perception that has been put out to humanity that if you do this type of thing, then you'll be blessed with this, right? It's a hilarious story. It's When you look back at it, when you grow older, you're like, man, why did I even believe that as a kid? But that's just what happens as a kid. You tend to believe a lot more things than what you do as an adult, right? Some people don't grow out of that child phase. They believe everything. But for the majority of people, we grow out of that phase. But what if I were to tell you that the Bible does talk about magic with frogs? What if I were to tell you that these frogs, while Disney says that they can turn into a prince, the Bible says that these frogs can do amazing things in the sight of men. What if I were to tell you, do you think that's real? Or do you think it's just fantasy like in Disney? So I'm going to reread our scripture text, and then we're going to go into our message. Now, if you want to read along with me, that's fine. It's Revelation 16, 13, and 14, and I'll wait for you while you get there. Remember, we're talking about frogs. And are they going to do a miraculous thing similar to the, the Disney prince, right? So let's look at Revelation 16, 13, and 14. Maybe after you hear this, some of you who like to kiss frogs won't kiss them anymore. <laughs> Revelation 16, verse 13 and 14 says, And I saw three unclean spirits like what? Frogs. frogs. What do they do? They come out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now this is interesting because it says in verse 14, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and the whole world, to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. So just by listening to this verse talking about these types of frogs, how many of you ladies would like to kiss this frog? Why? It's not a good frog. These are bad frogs. Who knows what will happen if you kiss this frog, right? You might turn into the frog this time. Who knows? But there is something to be said in Revelation to where it warns us about these unclean spirits that come out like frogs. Now, I'm going to point out and break down these two verses by sharing some things. The scripture text, as it talks about these three frogs, says that they're unclean spirits. So they're not your nice little frogs. They're actually evil. You know, every year in my rose, my rose garden in the back, I get toads. And they're awesome. And they don't do anything but hang out. They hang out in the bottom of my rose, especially when I water. They get underneath my water, and once the water sets, they're underneath all the, the wood chippings that I have there, and they stay cool. They stay there all day long until you water, and then they'll pull up again, and then go back under. My kids love seeing these things just like I do. And for two years, the toads were gone. I was like, what happened to my toad? And then all of a sudden, last year, they came back. And when I seen that, I called to my kids, look, the toads are there. They loved it, and every morning they would come out, where's the toad, right? Sometimes they couldn't find it, because it, the, the, the design of the toad, or the skin, or whatever you want to call it, looked exactly like my wood chippings. So it was camouflaged in the wood chippings in my roses. So they actually liked to see the, the toads. But here we're told that these frogs that are told about in Revelation 16, they're not something that we should look for. They're not something we should sought after because they come out of three bad things. What are those three bad things? It says they come out of the mouth of the dragon. They come out of the mouth of the beast. And they come out of the mouth of the false prophet. Now, according to the verses, 
What is the job of these three frogs? I'll go ahead and read the verse again. It says that they're spirits of devils doing what? They work miracles. So do frogs work miracles? Is it just a Disney tale? According to the Bible, these frogs work miracles. Now, friends, we're not talking about literal frogs. Okay, there's nothing special about that frog in your garden that's going to perform a miracle. We're talking symbolically. But the job of these frogs is to perform miracles. And because the Bible says that they are spirits of devils, I have a question. These frogs, whoever they are, and we'll be able to tell later on while we read the Bible and decide who they are. But these three frogs, their job is to create miracles. What type of miracles do you think they're going to do? Because here in Revelation chapter 16, it does not tell us what miracles that they're going to do. It does in other chapters, yes it does, but in this verse it doesn't say. So in order for us to find out what type of miracles that these frogs are going to perform, we have to look at the entirety of the Bible. But what are we looking for? Are we looking in Genesis and look, okay, where are the frogs at and what do they do? Is that the type of, of uh, detective work that we have to do through Scripture? No. Look at what the portion of verse 14 says. These frogs are described as what? Spirits of devils. What does that say to you and me? They're demons. They're the bad angels. They're the workers with Satan himself. So if they are these beings that we know as evil angels, uh, bad spirits, whatever the case may be, we know that these are what? They are the frogs. So any type of evil spirit that's out there that cohorts with Lucifer himself, they are considered these three frogs. And they are going to work with the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. But what type of miracles are they going to do? Because Revelation 16 verse 14 says that they're going to do miracles. So what we have to do is look at the Bible and see where does Satan and his angels perform miracles. And if they perform miracles, is it possible that the fulfillment of Revelation 16, which is our future and possibly currently our present, but our future, are these miracles going to happen in the same way that they did in the Old Testament and in the New Testament? As far as I know when I read my Bible, the Bible is repetitious. Things happen over and over and over again. Solomon himself said what? There's nothing new under the sun. Why? It happens over and over and over again. So I'm going to give you some examples of some miracles done in the Old Testament and the New Testament. And I, we want to see will they happen again in the same manner. Now, for time's sake, I won't give you all the scriptures, but I will give you some. But let me speak about the first miracle that I find in my Bible. The first miracle that I find in my Bible is the book of Genesis chapter 3. What is happening in Genesis chapter 3? We all know this is where Adam and Eve fell and they believed Lucifer, but why did they believe Lucifer? Why did he fall to the serpent's disguise? Why? Because a miracle that was transformed or a miracle that was made here in Genesis 3 was a miracle of transformation. Somehow or another, Lucifer was able to transform himself into what? A serpent, a snake, right? He was able to transform himself into a serpent, but not only just a serpent, the Bible tells us it was the most subtle of a creature that was made by God. When you look up the definition in the original language, the serpent itself was one of the greatest creatures that God had ever made next to mankind. So what did Satan do when he came to Eve? He disguised himself, or transformed himself 
into a creature that Eve would be comfortable with. He made evil, and I'll say it this way because it's contemporary. He made evil seem Christian. That's what he did. Could it be possible that in our times, my friends, this will happen again? Are we not seeing evil now become Christian? It's just a question we pose out there that we'll go on to later on. So Genesis 3, we find that one of the first miracles in the Bible is Satan used the miracle of transformation. What else, what else did he do? Satan transforms himself not only into a serpent, but the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 8, 14, that he can transform himself into, does anyone else know? An angel of light. And tell me this, when did Satan transform himself into an angel of light? When he was in the wilderness trying to deceive Jesus. Right? He was trying to get Jesus to do what? To go against God. To break God's commands. But did Jesus fall for it? No, he didn't. Because every single thing that Satan tried to do, he tried to get Jesus to go against God and put trust in himself. So what did this transformation of Satan do in the beginning? It caused Eve to stumble. And the second portion, when Satan transformed, he tried to get Jesus to stumble with the same exact temptations. Now we know, thankfully, Jesus survived this, and he didn't fall for the temptation. But we are told that the miracle in Genesis 3, and in the Gospels, and here in 2 Corinthians, the saint is able to transform himself to look different from what he looks like now. Is it possible that not only he has that ability, but that the other angels have that ability? It's possible. We know the angels of God have that ability. So why not the angels that were cast out of heaven with Lucifer? So we know that's a possibility that not only Satan, but his other angels have that ability to transform. Do we see it in other portions of the Bible? I'll give you the verse, but we won't read it for the sake of time. The story is told in Exodus 7, verse 10 through 12. Now, if you recognize this story, you'll understand that this is transformation. In the courts of Pharaoh himself in Egypt stood two men who were contending with Pharaoh to save God's people. And those two men were Moses and Aaron. Aaron was told by God to throw his staff, that he carry his walking stick, throw your staff on the floor, and what, transpo what transformed or excuse me, what happened to that staff? It transformed into what? A serpent, right? Then we have in the story is that Pharaoh calls his wise men, he calls his sorcerers, and he calls his magicians. And the Bible says there in verse 11 and 12, as he calls the sorcerers, the magicians, and wise men, that the Pharaoh tells each one of those groups, we don't know how many there were, but he tells someone from each of those groups to do the same. Why? And Moses and Aaron were trying to show Pharaoh God's power. That God was the true God, and that Pharaoh's gods were false. So they wanted to show Pharaoh their power, by doing the turning, throwing the staff and letting God turn it into a serpent. Pharaoh didn't find that impressive. He mocked them. Then he calls his three groups and tells them, do likewise. The Bible tells us that some people, we don't know how many, from the magicians, sorcerers, and wise men, they cast down their staffs as well. And what does the Bible say? Their staffs turn to snakes. Now we have a bunch of snakes rolling all over the place. Only one is a representation from God's side. Well, there's many. At least, let's say at the very least, there's three. One from each group. It's three to one. Who has the advantage? 
Pharaoh has the advantage. But yet we are told in the story is that because this story is not so much about the transformation, but about which God is greater, we are told that God's snake, casted by Aaron in his rod, actually ate the other snakes when there was only one left. And as Aaron calls up, picks up his rod, his rod transforms from a snake back to a rod. Transformation. So that right there, if we had the question beforehand, does only Satan have the power to transform and not his angels? Or do they all have the power to transform at the same time? I believe in this story shows that they all do. All Satan and his evil angels have the power to not only transform themselves, but to transform other items. Because here in the story, we see that the magicians, the sorcerers, and the wise men who are on the side of Lucifer, because they're on the side of Pharaoh, they were able to transform. They of themselves did not transform themselves, although they would believe that they did. But it was the power of evil that transformed them stabs. So a question goes, could we now or in the future see something change that would cause us to believe it as a miracle from God, but in reality, it's not? Is that possible? Let's say, what, what, what good example can we, can we give on transformation? What's a good example? Can anyone throw that out that may make you believe? Something dead comes to life. It's possible something dead comes to life. That's really not a given. Because the Bible tells us there's only one person who has the keys to death. And that's Jesus. But that can happen. Maybe we'll talk about it here in a little bit. What else? Can anyone else give me an example? Transformation. What about money? What if you pray for something? What if you say, I need this for this option, and you reach in your hand and all of a sudden there's money in there. But you reached in your pocket before and it wasn't there. Is that of God or is that of the devil? I can't answer that question. Because I don't know the situation and who you're praying to. I'm just throwing that as an example. So it depends on the situation and the biblical evidence whether it is of God or it's not. I do find it interesting though, is that when Aaron threw his rod down, it turned into a snake. Why do you think God chose a snake? Well, it was one of the gods of Egypt. It's even one of the gods of, like, uh, the Aztecs and Central America. It's a god to people. But yet God, through that serpent, was showing Pharaoh who really had the power. Because the serpent should have been on Pharaoh's side. But now it's on God's side. So I do believe, friends, that there will come a time, whether it's happening now or not, but there will become a time... When Satan will be able to transform not only himself, or the evil angels will be able to transform himself, but they will also be able to transform material objects to make us believe that they're miracles of God when they truly are not. Why do I say that? Because they have the power to do that. That's why. And remember, those evil spirits are doing what? Working miracles. Let's go on into another, another type of power that Satan has. Um, one of my favorite stories is the book of Job. You don't need to turn there because we're not going to look at all the verses. I'm just going to tell the story. But the book of Job, but if you want to, we're looking at chapter 1. The book of Job, I believe, is a tell-all story. And the first part, the first and second chapter, tells all about Satan himself. It actually reveals something that I believe Satan didn't want people to know. And some of the things that I believe that the Bible declares about Satan is about what he can do. What he has power over. Now, these can come in the form of miracles. Look at these. 
If you look in chapter 1 in the book of Job, verse 14 and 15, and also verse 17, you will see, and this is a, a, everyone should know this, you can see that Satan has power over people. He can control people. How he does it is another topic for another time. But he can control people. We're told here in the book of Job, uh, chapter 1, 14, 15, and 17, is that Satan caused two groups of people to come and kill all the livestock, or excuse me, all the slaves that Job had, and also to take all his livestock. <coughs> what we are told here in, the, in verse 14, 15, and 17 is Job's camels and oxen were all taken from him. This is his livelihood. This is how he makes money. And we're told that Job took this away from him. We all know the story of Job, right? He got permission from God in order to test Job. Because Satan believed that if he were to test Job and take things away from him, that he would curse God and not be the faithful person that God said he was. So God has allowed him to do this stuff to Job. He first takes his livestock. Then he takes his slaves and servants that were taking care of the livestock. Then we're told <coughs> excuse me, in verse 16 <clears throat> that these uh, that Satan himself caused fire to come down from heaven and it killed all his sheep and his servants. So, so far we know two things is that Satan can control men and he can also cause what to come down from heaven? He can cause fire to come down from heaven. Now, have any of you ever seen fire come down from heaven? Raise your hand. I'm sure a lot of you have. Falling stars, meteorites, they're basically fire from heaven. Now, is this what it's talking about? I don't know, and I don't really think it is. But it's possible. But somehow or another, Satan has the control of things to fall from the sky and kill people. Then we also have an understanding in verse 18 and 19, is that Satan has control over the weather. How many of you knew that? He has control over the weather because in verse 18 and 19 it says, that Satan caused the great wind to come, Possibly a tornado, we don't know. But it was a great wind that was so heavy and fast and strong is that it crumbled the house that his kids were in and it killed every single one of them. So does Satan have that type of power according to the book of Job? Yes, he does. He has power to control people, to do what he wants. He has power to call down fire from the sky. And he has the control of the weather. But he has one more power that the book of Job talks about. It's the power in chapter 2, verse 7, called disease. We know this because in verse 7 it says, that Satan caused boils to come upon Job and infect his entire body. Now, has anybody ever had a, a boil? One, two, three. They are the most painful thing you have ever gone through. I've had one. It was excruciating pain. It was burning pain, itching pain. And when they cut it out finally and they stuff it with all the material they stuff it inside of to clean it out, that's even more painful. Or when you go take your next visit and they yank all that stuff out of there and put it back in, it hurts even more. Anybody else go through this? No? It was, it was a different story situation? That's what happened with me. Mine was almost the size as a baseball when they took it out. It grew rapidly. And that thing hurt. Now, I can just imagine Job having them all over his body. And I just had one. It's amazing to think about what Satan can cause people to have. So he can control people. He can control fire coming down from heaven. He can control the weather. But he also has power of disease. And what's interesting in the book of Job is we never find that he was healed by Satan 
of the boils. Because Satan was the one that put it on. We know that God's the one that healed him. But I tend to ask myself a question. Is if Satan is able to put on a disease upon a person, is he able to take it off and proclaim a miracle? It's something that we need to think about, especially in our day today. Now we're going to come back to these, I call them miracles in the book of Job, of what Satan has control over. We're going to come back to them in a little bit. Now let's move on to the New Testament. There are so many stories, but I can only pick a couple. Another thing that Satan has the power, and many people don't believe this, one of the things that Satan has the power over, including his angels, is two factors. The power to possess people, which I'm sure everyone believes, but also the power to make people rich. Now, most people, they don't think about when you're rich, they don't think about possession or that the devil controls people. But in reality, if you look at those cases on a case-by-case -case basis, you will find that there are a lot of people who actually obtain their riches, but prior to that, they've accepted Satan into their lives one way or another. It, it's just common knowledge. You hear too many interviews right now. But, the Bible does give us an indication that this actually happened, and it's found in the book of Acts chapter 16. And it's also verse 16. It says, as Paul was walking down the road, there was a lady who kept bothering them, saying to the town people, this is Jesus, this is not Jesus, this man is with Jesus, he knows Jesus, this man is a man of God. And Paul turned to her and rebuked her. Not only rebuked her, because she was saying the proper thing, but she was being an antagonist to them and to others that were around them. And people weren't believing Paul because of her, because of who she was. Now, who was she? This woman, according to verse 16, <coughs> it says, As she came to pass, <coughs> and as we went to prayer, there was a certain damsel who was possessed. She was possessed with the spirit of divination that met us, which brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. Now, what is soothsaying? It's using astrology. You know those people who use the stars to tell your future or to tell you, you know, don't go out today because this is going to happen according to your star chart. These types of people. These are just not common people. Even pres presidents use these types of people. Apparently, according to the book of Acts, is this lady was possessed by a demon and that demon was working through her to make other people who believed her and wanted to work with her rich. Because it says here in the verse that she brought her masters much gain by soothsaying. So whatever that the demon was using with this astrology, he was using it to gain other people riches. So they were becoming rich because they were working with the devil, basically. And the only people, <coughs> excuse me, the only people who got mad at Paul because he casted the demon out were those who were making money off of her. They weren't happy because the demon was released. They were mad because it didn't stay there. Because they would rather make money rather than see her well. So here's another example of what the demons can do. That they can actually possess people. We know that Satan turned himself into a snake, right? But now we can see that the demons can possess people and use bad ways, bad tactics, bad things, in order to make others rich. We know that. That can happen. Now, Revelation 16, verse 14, this is one of our scripture texts, says this. Think upon everything we talked about so far. Revelation 16, verse 14 says, For they are the spirits of devils, working miracles, which go forth unto the kings of the earth, and of the whole world to gather them to battle of that great day of God Almighty. So we know that these frogs are evil spirits. We know that these frogs are supposed to work miracles. But where and who are they supposed to be working miracles for? According to the scripture. For the kings 
of the earth and of the whole world. So this, whoever these frogs are, they don't work local. Whoever these frogs are that are working miracles, their job is to go to the leaders of the world in order to convince them that whatever their message is, that they should believe them. Their job is not only to go to these leaders, these kings of the world, but to everyone else to show them miracles so that way others can believe them as well. Now imagine a time when evil angels are going throughout the world, not only going to leaders, but cities and other towns, and they're performing miracles, and everyone sees this as a miracle of God, yet they're deceived because they're really evil angels. Imagine that happening. You don't have to imagine it's going to happen. But think about it. Is it even happening now? Some years ago, there's a church up there in the Heights. I won't say which church it is. It's a mega church. I will give the location. It's off of Eubank. <laughs> <clears throat> there's several there, so you have to decide for yourself and find out. But it was, let me say about 10 years ago. And they were promoting an event. It was on a Sunday. And they were promoting it to everyone here in Albuquerque. Come to such and such church on this day, this time. And you yourself can physically talk to the resurrected apostles of Jesus. That interests me. I'm like, what are these people talking about? So I dug deeper and look more to the article and stuff that they're writing. It turns out that this church believed that there was a group of 12 men that all of a sudden resurrected and are physically, literally physically, you touch them, talk to them, slap them in the head, whatever you want to do. They were literally the resurrected apostles of Jesus. And they were walking the earth. <coughs> and it so happened that this church was able to bring them into their fellowship to talk to, to preach to, and to answer questions to anybody in the audience. What do you think about that? Resurrected apostles. Their job was to show themselves, but to teach or to share with others and to help them know what they had to say. If they were supposedly, though they are supposedly the resurrected apostles, but what type of message do you think they had for that congregation and anybody else who showed up? Do you think it was a biblical message? Why? They're at a church. Isn't that where you know, the true word of God is supposed to be met? We can all have our differences and the way we do things, but it's at a church. How can you say something that's out of church is bad? I'm giving you what the regular person says. Yes, some of us may know better, but the majority don't. I wonder how many people, I didn't go, by the way, just in case you're wondering, but I wonder how many people actually went there. Because their congregation is huge. But I wonder how many people other than their congregation went to go hear what these resurrected apostles had to say. I wish they would have had it on YouTube. Maybe I shouldn't have watched it, you know, if they did have it on YouTube, but you know, it's 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 interesting to think that this is actually happening, and maybe some of us don't even know it because we're not paying attention. But yet there's gonna come a time where we can't help but pay attention because it's gonna be everywhere. Now let's go on. <clears throat> Our scriptures tell us, our scripture reading says that they're unclean frogs. There's three of them. They're spirits of, of evil angels doing miracles. <clears throat> they're performing these miracles to kings and all the people of the world. And I find it interesting that Revelation 16 says that they're working miracles. And then you read Revelation 13.3. If you want to turn there, Revelation 13.3 
says that all the world would do what? Wonder after the beast. You know, when I looked at this verse in this context, when, when I was putting this together, I said, no wonder why it uses that word wonder. Because if you use it in a different fashion, in, in, with regard to the text that you're reading in verse 1, 2, 4, and 5, before and after, that word sticks out. I mean, how could everyone actually wonder after the beast? I mean, literally, how could people want to follow something that's openly evil? How? And then you look at the definition of wonder. <clears throat> the definition of wonder says that it's a feeling of surprise, of admiration, of something unexpected. And then it hit me. What are these three frogs supposed to be doing in the last days? Performing miracles. What are miracles? They make you feel surprised that it happened. They make you admire the person who performed the miracle. And it truly was something unexpected. A miracle is the definition of wonder. And wonder is the definition of a miracle. It makes you wonder in this context in Revelation 13.3... When it says that all wondered after the beast. And what was the point of these three frogs? To go perform miracles to who? Basically to all the world. So these miracles that are going to be seen are going to be sought or <clears throat> sought and seen all over the world. And many people are going to fall for it. Or, as the Bible says, they're going to wonder after it. So many will fall for these miracles. Many will feel surprised. Many will feel admiration. Many will actually have something unexpected happen to them that they would call a miracle. Now, <clears throat> let's look at some other examples. 1 Corinthians 11, 13, and 14 says this. Now, we're talking about the last days here. For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, and the next wording that it uses there, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel for Satan himself, <coughs> he uses that word there, is transformed into an angel of light. Now, when I was writing this, I was writing it in exactly the order that I'm giving it to you today. And I was interested in the fact that I see Satan in Genesis 3 transforming himself into the serpent. I see him transforming himself into an angel of light <coughs> in, in the wilderness with Jesus. <coughs> but yet, in 1 Corinthians 11, 13 and 14, it's speaking about a future time. Not necessarily the end time, <coughs> but a future time. To where it says that there are some false apostles, excuse me, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, and they're transforming in their, themselves into the apostles of Christ. Now in context, what Paul is warning here in the Corinthian church is that there are people that are going to fulfill what Jesus talked about in Matthew 24. Where he says false Christs are going to come in my name. This is what Paul is talking about. He's warning about people who are going to be now claiming to be Christian. Or followers of Christ. Or what does he use there? Apostles of Christ. Now that's, that's not possible. Because an apostle, a definition of apostle. Is someone who actually was following Christ while Jesus was alive. If you're... If you are following Jesus, but yet you weren't there with him while he was alive, then you're known as a disciple. But he says here that people are going to transform themselves and make others aware that they are apostles of Christ. But he also says that they're false apostles. They're deceitful workers. They may transform into this, but they are false. 
And it says, And no mortal, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. What here is Paul warning about? People who are rising up, <clears throat> claiming to be Christ. Now, what do I mean by that? People who are claiming to be Christ by saying they follow Christ. They are Christians. But they do things to where they make others want to follow themselves instead of Jesus. And you can find these in other scriptures of Paul's writings. Now, these are deceitful workers. Could they be performing miracles? It's possible. I believe here that this portion in 1 Corinthians 11, as he's warning about false Christians, is actually talking about those who profess to take the name of I'm going to say pastor. But there are other forms. I will use also leader of a church. Because whenever Christians gather, they always usually have a leader. And what we have to understand is here, Paul is warning against those who are preaching a false gospel. Now this isn't fully true the way I'm going to say it now. But it seems to be that the false gospel gets more worshipers, or attention, or members. What other word could I use, right? And those that usually preach the truth have less. That's not always the case, but it's the majority. And here we find, and Paul dealt with this a lot, <clears throat> is that when he first went to a place... He had many converts to Christianity, and then years later when he came back or he wrote a letter to them, he said, what happened? You lost your first love, and now you're following something else. And we find out what that something else was. It was someone from amongst the brethren that came up and started teaching something else that Paul shared in the beginning. And he caused others to leave Jesus and follow after him. This is the context in which Paul is talking about. Now, are we living in that reality now? Because they were back then. Because Paul's writing about it. But we're immediately living in that time right now. Not only is it happening in churches around, but it's happening, happening in social media. Where there's many people who have a following of thousands of people who watch their videos. And their videos, I will say, are garbage. Yet many people think that they're biblical. I run across these all the time and I talk to people all the time about some of these things. But let's move on. You remember uh, Job's issues when Satan is showing his power? We talked about his transformation in Genesis 3. And now we talked about uh, people transforming into so-called workers of Christ. But what was one of the other miracles, if you want to say, that happened in the book of Job that Satan showed that he could perform? One of them was fire coming down from heaven. Show of hands, how many of you have, fire, have the ability to cast fire to come down from heaven? Nobody, right? Nobody has that power. But there's someone who has that power. We know in the book of Job it's Satan. But what does Revelation say about that. Revelation 13, verse 13 and 14, it says, And he doeth great wonders. There's that wonder word again. He doeth great wonders. Whenever you see wonders, I want you to think miracles. So he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven to the earth in the sight of who? In the sight of men. So will people see this? Yes, they will. And it says, <coughs> And deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of what? Those miracles. So is calling fire down from heaven considered a miracle? Yes, it is. This is why I said in the book of Job, many people don't see it as a miracle, but according to Revelation, it is a miracle. Because no one has that power. But Satan does. 
But by those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of who? The beast. Saying to them that dwell on the earth, that they should make an image to the beast, which hath the wound by a sword, and did live. So there's a lot to talk about there, but let me pull out one portion of it for the topic. It's saying miracles are going to happen in the last days. Revelation 13. But specifically, what type of miracle? Fire coming down from heaven. Who was going to see it? Everybody. All mankind is going to see fire coming down from heaven, but it's going to be cast out by a certain individual. What's the purpose of calling fire down from heaven? Did you catch it? What's the purpose? Is it just to make people scared? Is it just to say, Ooh, look, I have the power. I'm going to call fire down now. What is the purpose? The purpose of calling fire down from heaven is there at the, at the end. Because the purpose of calling down the fire to the earth, it says that they should make what? An image to the beast, which hath the wound by the sword, which is talking about the papacy, right? And did live. So what's the whole purpose when all of a sudden, someone starts calling down fire from the sky, and everyone in the world sees this? Now think about that. This is the little fire coming down from the sky. And this is not a local event. This is not just some meteor shower that only a certain state sees or a certain country sees. This is fire that's going to come down from the sky that everybody sees. And what's the purpose? The purpose of that or the cause of that is to force men to do what? Set up an image to the beast. So the purpose of this miracle of calling down fire is to force false worship. Something is going to happen when these fires come down that's going to cause the world to want to bring up this image. It's going to call them to go back to the beast. Could it be that Maybe this is literal fire that destroys a great population of the world. And because that happens, most people will congregate together on the only thing that has power at that time, which is the papacy. That's possible. I don't know if that's going to happen, but it's possible. Could it be that maybe this event does happen and it causes problems around the world and and maybe governments are falling, and maybe governments need help by other governments. And then it causes worldwide panic and chaos to where now we're under a different system that's supposed to help us, yet it brings us into a, more of like a martial law status. Could it be? It's possible. But sometimes we don't look at these verses to see that this is exactly what it's talking about. <clears throat> now I want to share something that's very interesting. So far we talked about transformation. We talked, we know that he that Satan himself can control people. We saw that in Job. We can see that throughout Revelation 13, especially here, because whichever miracle he does with the fire coming down out of heaven. It literally controls other people to want to set up a false system of worship. This is just what happens. But what so far have we talked? Have we talked? Have we not talked about in the book of Revelation that we talked about in the book of Job? What happened in the book of Job that we haven't yet talked about? We haven't talked about disease yet, because the last thing that Satan went after Job to get him to not follow God, was he cursed him with boils, which is disease. If all these other things that happen in Job are happening in Revelation, could it be that disease is really the last step that Satan is going to use to hurt the world? We know that fire coming down from heaven is going to help set up the image of the beast, because that's what it says here in Revelation 13, 14. That's what it says. 
What is disease going to do? Now, when you go back to the frogs, <clears throat> they're evil spirits. They perform miracles. But where do they come out of? They come out of the dragon. And who is the dragon? He's Satan. They come out of the beast. Who is the beast? He's the papacy. Who is the false prophet? Many people do not know that answer. The false prophet is apostate Protestant Christianity. So the three frogs, they work miracles that are unclean spirits. That their job is to go to the world. Firstly, it's used by Satan. We saw that in Genesis 3. Then it's used by the beast. We, say, we saw here in Revelation 16, fire coming down from heaven, that it's used to make an image to the beast. But what about the false prophet? Because the frog comes out of there too. I wonder if the false prophet has something to do with the last miracle that happened in the book of Job, which is disease. Will this false prophet, this frog that comes out of the false prophet, bring some type of disease that will lead the world into believing Satan and also being, making people part of setting up the image of the beast? Could it be part of? Now, this is just me looking at things, right? I find some things interesting that's happening in the news lately. Now, for the sake of not being banned from Facebook or YouTube, I have to use initials. We all went through the C theme. You understand by that, right? And that's not what I'm talking about, okay? Just in case you're interested. We all went through those couple years of dealing with C. But, that didn't hurt us. That didn't cause us to set up an image to the beast. But is there something coming down the line that is working with the, the dragon, working with the, the beast, that's related to the false prophet, that will bring about disease? <laughs> Let me give you some interesting things. And I, I can't name names, because I'll get this thrown off. Social media. There is a college on the East Coast that for some reason, I have no idea why. It came out last year that in one of their labs, they decided to look at a disease, which we just recently went through, and some are still dealing with today. And they decided what we are going to do with this disease is we are going to make it 10 times more infectious and 10 times more deadly. Why would a college here in this country want to make a disease 10 times worse after seeing what it did to our world? Why would they do that? I don't have the answer to that. But well, why would they do that? It's interesting. What another thing I find interesting. There's a group. Most of you know who, who the group is. Most of you won't. But I won't explain anymore. You can look it up yourself. Called the World Economic Forum. Any of you have heard of this? They meet all the time. Their current uh, talks that they have is about climate change and, and all that other great stuff. But recently, in this past a couple weeks ago, they had met together to talk about their yearly theme, and they brought up disease. And I found it interesting on what they said about disease. They mentioned about what we prior went through and how it affected the world. But they said, something will happen in our near future, they're talking years, will happen like years, like a handful of years. Something will happen in our near future that is not going to be anything near to where we went through, but it's going to be worldwide devastation. They said it is going to happen. And they mentioned it, disease X is what they call it. They, didn't, they are calling it disease X because they don't know a name. They said they don't know what disease it is. But they know for sure that it's going to happen in the next several years. 
How they know that, I have no idea. I, I have some hints, some clues and facts, but I have no idea. But when I look at these things, I tend to wonder, are they telling us before it actually happens? Because believe it or not, COVID was actually, I said the C word, I wasn't supposed to say that. The C word was actually talked about as early as 2008, talked about again 2010, 2012, and mentioned that it would happen in less than five years back in 2018. The literal thing we went through was talked about happening. In, what would you say, in the, the news, it was talked about. So I tend to wonder if these people are talking about this, is it possible it could happen? Well, the question answered is, I believe it is. Because it happened in the book of Job, the way it's happening in Revelation so far, we know the plagues are pretty much considered a disease, right? But we're talking prior to the plagues. Now here's something interesting on why I think it's going to be disease. And it could be a variety of things, because remember, it's also going to be fire falling from the sky. But let me end with this. Whatever happens have to, has to be worldwide. And we know one of the frogs' description is they have to go worldwide to deceive with miracles. I believe it's going to be disease is because if Satan can put on a disease like he did with Job, I believe he has the ability to take it off. And what better way to convince people that it was a miracle of God than by giving a disease to someone and taking it off? Because if you do that to someone, are they ever grateful for that person who does that? Will they believe more things from that person that does that? I believe so. But what's interesting when you read the book of Revelation 13, it talks about a time when the beast is starting to take control because this fire is coming down and it causes people to set up an image or people are, are uh, people have Satan leading them which is Revelation 13 as well or something is transformed because you have all these so called godly men that are preaching a fake gospel yet they are ungodly all these things happening through Revelation where does disease fit in? It's a worldwide phenomenon that many people in the world in power today are saying is going to happen again. And if you don't believe that what they say is real, I think you need to pay more attention to what's happening in our world. Pay attention to politics in the form of not who you're going to vote for, but by laws being passed. Because when the Bible says that the U.S. will speak like a dragon, it's talking about speaking with their laws, not speaking anyways else. And the disease, fire from the, from the skies, what we find interesting in Revelation 13 is, there is something that's going to happen worldwide, especially here in the U.S., that's going to cause a lot of us to lose our rights, lose our constitution, our bill of rights. Anything that gives the regular person rights, it's going to go away. Where in history have we found when a great event happened where we as Americans lost our rights? It happened through this recent event that we went through, the C word. It also happened in 2001 during 9-11. It happened after that. What's coming next to where a lot of us are going to lose our rights? Because remember, in Revelation 13, what does the beast do to those who can't believe or don't believe? You can't buy or sell, which means what? You can't feed your family. You can't live in a house. You basically lose your rights over a lot of things. Or not necessarily your rights, but lose your ability to do a lot of things because you, you cannot buy or sell. What else does it do? It takes away your freedom of religion. Why? Because the only person that you can worship, according to Revelation 13 at this time, is the beast. And if you don't worship the beast, what is your consequence? Death or imprisonment. 
Your rights, my friends, are going away. And we know that this only happens here in the U.S. is when there's a big disaster. If you don't believe me, how many of you were out of your rock when the sea happened? How many of us lost rights on where we can go? How many of us lost rights on when we're allowed to buy and where we're allowed to buy? Now, it didn't go as far as worship, although some people will claim it did, but it didn't go that far. But it was there. And a lot of people fought back out of it. I mean, think about it. The government was going against Christians who wanted to worship on Sunday, and they were fining them, they were putting them in jail for wanting to worship, but yet they were allowing bars to casinos to be open. Think about that. The sea time showed us a lot about Revelation 13, yet we don't realize it. But it's more than just the things that, that we went through during the sea time. Now the Bible is saying miracles are going to happen. Isaiah says in Isaiah 8, uh, 520, says that there's going to come a time before Jesus comes back where the good is going to be called evil, and the evil is now going to be looked at as good. Or the way I like to put it, evil will now become Christian, and Christian will now become evil. That's our reality and that's our day we're living in. The only thing that we have not witnessed now, because we've witnessed worldwide disease already, but not in the full scale that Revelation is talking about. But it's still to come. We haven't witnessed fully that yet. And we haven't witnessed these miracles in the form of fire coming down from the sky. When those things happen, my friends, who are you going to believe? Let's be honest. Many of you here will say, no, I'm not going to believe that stuff. That's nonsense. That's, that's above me. I, I don't believe that. Yet, I know people who are in this church, not here locally, but in our Adventist church, <laughs> are so, what's the right word? They're so deceived that they believe that their day was made so special by God because when they woke up and they had their breakfast, they saw Jesus in a tortilla. And that's a Seventh-day Adventist. We're supposed to know this stuff, but yet we fall for this stuff. Or, yes, there's a cloud in the sky that recently, I don't know if you've seen these pictures, there's a cloud in the sky that looks like angels, or there's a cloud in the sky that looks like a lion, or They've seen Jesus with his hands stretched out, or they've seen chariots, or they're hearing weird noises. They say because we hear noises of trumpets, that says that Jesus is coming back and the rapture is going to happen. All these things that are happening around the world. Have you not heard about these things? Have you not heard about thousands of birds falling from the sky for no reason? The whales and sharks showing up on the shore for no reason, dead. All these things that are happening around the world. And it's linked to God. And many people are saying these things are happening because our rapture is about to happen. My friends, those are all false miracles. They're tragedies because all these animals are dying, but they're false miracles. But yeah, these things are going to happen and they're going to take place in abundance to where everyone across the world is going to see them. The reason why I brought this up is because I know so many people, not only of this faith, but other faiths, that are falling for these deceptions. What's going to happen, my friends, and I'll end with this. Many of us here, I hate to use this analogy, but how many of us here have lost a loved one? We all have, right? What if all of a sudden you wake up in the middle of the night, go in your kitchen, and your loved one's there making you a drink. Or sitting at the table. And they say, come. Talk to me. I have something to tell you. And if you're an Adventist. And they tell you. You remember all that time. We, we, we said the Sabbath was like the core message of scripture. You know. When I was in heaven. God told me I was wrong. You don't need to keep the Sabbath. 
You know, you can believe that, that I can communicate with you because here I am. Not knowing, friends, that another miracle that is said in the Bible that I didn't mention was what happened with Saul and the witch. That can happen to each and every one of us. And guess what? It's a miracle. And if they can do miracles like that in the Old Testament, what makes you think they can't do it now? I use that example because I know it touches every single one of us. I know it happened a couple times to some of my family members after they lost someone. I know it hasn't happened to me yet because I believe in God. But still, could there come a time in my weakness where I'm so weak that Satan will use that? It's possible, friends. For those of you who read Spirit Prophecy, you know I'm not lying. But it's going to come. These miracles are going to happen. And it's up to us to decide whether they're godly or not. And the only way that we can know if they're true or not is by what do the scriptures say. If they're, if they're not, if the scriptures don't say that they're real, then we don't believe and we don't follow. Because these miracles are intended by these frogs. They're intended to deceive us and to lead us to creating a false gospel or image to the beast. That's their intention. And I know none of us want to do that. So we need to be careful about these miracles. Amen? Amen. Let us close with the word of prayer. Loving Heavenly Father, I thank you for this time in which you've given me and given all of us. There's more I wanted to say, Heavenly Father, but I stopped because of time, but I hope that each and every one of us will take some time to read and understand what is saying, being said here in your word to protect us, Heavenly Father. You said many things in Matthew 24 to protect the disciples after the fall of Jerusalem. And those that did understand and those that did follow Heavenly Father were saved. We want to do likewise. Pretty soon we are going to be surrounded, Heavenly Father. And we just pray that you will protect us <coughs> and tell us when to flee and what to do and what to believe. Do not allow each and every one of us to be overcome by miracles and false deception, Heavenly Father, that are by Satan and his angels. But protect our bodies, protect our mind, and help us to ever rely faithfully and solely upon you. We just thank you for this time and ask a blessing as we continue with our Sabbath. But always help us to keep in mind about how important our daily relationship is to you. We thank you for this time. And in Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. Amen. Shall we all stand? Our closing hymn will be 608, Faith in the Victory.
thanks for this time and opportunity that we can come together and worship you. We were truly blessed, Heavenly Father, and we just pray that as we convene from this time and this service, as we move on with our Sabbath day, that you will continue to be with us. And wherever it is that we go, that your Holy Spirit will be amongst us as well. We thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Hope you all have a wonderful Sabbath. Yes. Thank you.